Here are the faces of today's honored patriots. Sixty years ago, we British described these very people as murder gangs, rats, vermin, etc., etc. You are now looking at some of the Irish people who personally persuaded the British imperial power after 750 years of occupation to leave that part of their small island which is today's Republic of Ireland. They have something to say. They hope that their words will help us to understand the Irish question. to be one voice. We're one people with many voices. And, and there are many who have different views. But we're an ancient people who had a civilization of a thousand years and our own laws, which were overturned. Maura Comerford, patriot and activist for the Irish Republican Army. The two countries started with similar populations, only about two or three million between them. But the British policy has made my country small and kept my country the only one in Europe which is denuded of population, which has a, until recently a shrinking population, while their, pop, their own population has soared. And we have been retained as their servants and their suppliers of soldiers or laborers. Uh, the circumstances of the time were that the British government, in uh, fulfilling its appointments here in this country, brought in people mostly from England, but from the other parts of Britain, from Scotland, Wales, and uh, very few, very, very few Irish people had a chance of getting appointments in their own country. So that education was geared more, mostly for export and quite a number of the young men of my day, when they didn't go abroad, mainly went to the British colonies. Uh, those who had lesser education, of course, uh, went to the United States or to Canada. Joseph Sweeney, sometime fighter for the Irish Republican Army, today a retired Major General of the Irish Army. Would you explain to me, Sean, as fully as possible, why you felt compelled to take action against Britain all those years ago? Well, I don't consider it so much action against Britain as action for Ireland, for the liberation of Ireland. My principal activity was on the intelligence side. And uh, I had the great good fortune to work for Michael Collins, who was our great man of that movement. Sean Kavanagh, secret agent for the Irish Republican Army. Can I ask you, at this stage, if you can throw your mind back, what were your personal emotions? that compelled you to become an activist? What we heard at home from our parents' tradition, fathers and grandfathers and friends and neighbors, that tradition came down every year, every generation. And uh, the school teachers at the time uh, were very actively 
engaged in teaching history. And Irish history is a tragic history. And if you were an Irishman, just like if you were a native of any country, you love your own country. And people are prepared to make sacrifices for the right to live and to govern their own country. John O'Sullivan, sometime fighter in the Irish Republican Army, now senior member of the Dáil, uh, the Irish Parliament, uh, from County Cork. Dr Thornton, would you please explain to me as fully as possible why you felt compelled to get rid of the British presence here in Ireland? Because I felt they had no right or reason here. We were a separate island and we felt we owned it and we should own it and no intruder or, or I don't know what other word he used, could or should have any act or part in it. Breed Thornton, a sometime activist for the Irish Republican Army, today a doctor of medicine. I was always imbued with that spirit that England had no right whatever here and we wanted at some day or stage to get them out. They were uh, invaders and we felt that England took up a great attitude of the dreadful de doings of the Germans when they occupied Belgium. And we began to, I began to feel, and we did in school, why were they here? That there was no reason for them to be invading, to have invaded Ireland and to have remained so long. Would you tell me, Sean, uh, how you first got involved? The Countess Markovic said, why should a British Boy Scout movement be organised here to recruit Irish boys? So she formed an organisation known as Fianna Erdn, the Irish National Boy Scout Organisation. And uh, it took very well. There was companies in the north side of the city and in the south side. Sean Houston was in charge in the north side. He was executed in 1916. And Con Colbert was in charge of the south side. And he was executed in 1916. But it was not until 1913, four years after Madame's Boy Scout movement had started, that I went to uh, join. Sean Harling, who joined the activists of Ireland at a very early age. Sir, would you explain to me as fully as possible why you felt compelled to take action against the British presence here in Ireland all those years ago? Because from my very earliest childhood I had heard both in song and story tales of the brutal oppression to which we were subjected to both in uh, religious bigotry and for military oppression too. Martin Walton, a sometime gunman for the Irish Republican Army, today Ireland's leading music publisher. So I applied for the, for the Dublin police. My father didn't want me to leave the place at all. And he, he burdened the papers when they came from Dublin Castle. Why didn't he want you to join the police? I don't really know. He, didn't want, he wanted me to stop at home growing up to be a vegetable. But I, I wanted to shake the dust of the place off my feet. I wanted to find the streets paved with gold. I'm looking for them still, by the way. <laughs> so I applied to a neighbour, and I gave a neighbour's address, and the papers came down from Dublin Castle again. So I found myself on the way to Dublin for a medical examination. My father gave me five pounds, all the wealth he could spare. So I took off on the old slow-moving slow train from West Limerick, which is down to south-west of Ireland, landed in Dublin. David Nelligan, who joined the British Dublin police, but who, in fact, was soon serving the Irish Republican Army. So the fallen day was sworn into the DMP, the Dublin police. Colonel Nelligan is one of Ireland's most famous secret double agents. 
I saw it past the orderly room and there was a communique up and it told of this rising in Dublin and it told of the executions of men whose names I never had heard, Clark, Pierce, Connolly and the rest of them. Naturally enough, I would have been at the time about 18. I wondered what it was all about and what happened and of course I got the British side of it. But what struck me first was the long drawn out time they took between executions, one one day, two, two days afterwards and so on. And that put me thinking, of course at that time I had no conception of Irish nationality. And I was brought up in a period of uh, and school days, I could name every king and queen of Britain or of England, but I knew nothing about any of our own past people because it was definitely excluded from all schools, not alone the national schools, but a Jesuit college that I went to afterwards. Uh, in short, the whole country apparently at that period without I thinking it was in any way extraordinary, uh, was an accepted subject race of Britain. Commandant General Thomas Barry, one of the most successful guerrilla leaders against the British that Ireland has ever produced. General Barry was a soldier in the British Army when he first heard that some of his compatriots had risen in rebellion in Dublin. It was Easter time in the year 1916. Edmund Spencer, poet in the year 1595. England will bring the Irish so low that he shall have no heart nor ability to endure his wretchedness, so pluck him on his knees that he will never be able to stand up again. English order issued from Dublin Castle to English soldiers in Ireland in the year 1642. Wound, kill and destroy by all the ways and means you may, all the Irish rebels, and burn, spoil, waste, consume, and demolish all places, towns, and houses, and all hay and corn there, and kill and destroy all the men inhabiting, able to bear arms. 